Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Yvette. It's, it's very nice to be back. Um, Elaine and I are here to talk about uh, what we do and the computers that we uh, are going to be putting into San Quentin. From my glasses. Um, this is going to be a little interactive, so I want to sort of warn you guys right off the bat. <clears throat> I'm not nervous. If, if you knew where I worked, uh, you would know something about my nerves. But we do have just a minor glitch, and that is uh, my speaking notes were lost two days ago. So I started to panic. I still had these that I had typed up. And so we did the run through, and it sounded really, really bad. So Elena is going to um, sort of key in when I forget things, which is going to be often. We're going to run microphones around because I'm going to skip things, and you're going to get confused. You're going to say, West, please stop. Please tell me what you're talking about. Um, Sally and Marie, thank you very much for running around with the mics. Elena, thank you for interrupting me frequently. Uh, enough with the disclaimers. Before we begin, um, like Yvette said, uh, I do three things. I teach a poetry and drama class inside of San Quentin State Prison. I coordinate a program of about 70 tutors and teachers that go into San Quentin who teach and tutor in various subjects, uh, ranging from basic GED, ESL, reading comprehension, um, all the way up to advanced things like uh, mechanical engineering, computer-aided design, uh, and Adobe products. The third thing I do is I coordinate a two-unit course here on campus called Teach in Prison, where we talk about those two things. We talk about coordinating the program, and we talk about what we do on the inside. Elena does the exact same thing as me. Um, she wins at rock, paper, scissors when we decide who's going to give the presentation and who's going to work the slides. She teaches art instead of poetry, which I think is very cool, but slightly less cool than poetry. Um, because poetry is scary. It's much scarier than being up here. And we were trying to come up with why that is, and I think we came up with a good solution. The moment we walked in here this morning, we're humans. I took a look at this podium. I asked three things. Is it a threat? Can I eat it? Can I have sex with it? In a millisecond, I figured it out. And as soon as I knew, I could lean on it, I could put my stuff behind it, and I could think about eating other things, fighting other things, and having sex with other things. Poetry does not work that way. Poetry takes time. You have to read it over and over and over again. And that thing that your mind is craving, that, that structure that it's craving, what is it? I need to know right now. It doesn't work. That freaks people out. It makes people very uncomfortable. Another reason why I think it's cooler than fine art is because I can't draw, and Elena can. Um, here's sort of a vague overview of what we're going to try to accomplish today. We're going to ask a lot of questions. We're going to talk about a jail called Stanford. We're going to do some stats. We're going to talk about where our program is now. I don't think we'll talk about our big problem much. We're going to talk about our simple solution. Um, we'll try to sort of stick to that. Elena's going to keep me on track. Still, we'll probably fall off some. I figured we start with the jail called Stanford. Does it bug you guys when I walk in front of the, I think you know what, I think it bugs the other campuses. So we'll be turning it on and off. Let me know if anyone seizes. We'll stop. Um, who knows the, the Stanford prison experiment? Again, I don't have my glasses. I saw at least three hands go up. Sally or Elena, or rather uh, Marie. Keep your hands up. Don't be afraid. Psych majors are great. Just hand out a microphone somewhere. Who's got the mics? Please keep your hands up. Hi. 
That's Denora. Yeah. I can't even see that far, but I recognize your voice. <laughs> so what am I supposed to say? What it is? Yeah. Tell a little bit about it. Um, it was an experiment where um, <clears throat> uh, students were assigned to be guards and um, or prisoners and um, <clears throat> something about how it uh, brought out the brutality of the, the maybe inherent potential for brutality in, in uh, people who are assigned to be the guards. Exactly. An experiment in, in, in human traits. Who remembers, who, when did it go down? Approximately, 19? Yeah, exactly. Did, has anyone actually studied this in class? This is actually one of the reasons why I got into this to begin with. But I've never actually studied it in class. I've only picked up things that I've learned from reading it myself, from reading the, the, the actual summary of the project. Who knows it well? Give me, give me, give me one more quick spiel. We've got guys in Santa Cruz like raising their hands like mad right now. This is embarrassing. <laughs> the whole room is raising their hand right now. Okay, is there any way to, there's no way to get that up there, is there? No. These guys are laughing at you. So, so basically, yeah, they all, uh, the guy's name was uh, Dr. Phil Zimbardo. And what he did was he built a prison in the basement of the psych department at Stanford University. And one Sunday morning, a nice young man, college student, was walking out on his front porch. He bent over, picked up his newspaper. They cuffed him, threw him into the back of a screaming police car, sped him off, and all the neighbors were scratching their heads. I thought he was such a nice boy. What happened? Nine such arrests were made that morning. They were all charged with armed robbery and burglary, I believe. But that wasn't the real charge. The real charge was... Um, that they had all answered a classified ad for $15 a day. And they were asked in that class, once they got there by Dr. Phil Zimbardo and team, um, to flip coins. About 80 people came. They flipped coins. Who would be, who would be a guard? Who would be an inmate? Um, after mental screening, they, they pared it down to about 18. No one with... Uh, history of, of addiction, no one with mental, determinable mental illnesses. They sort of weeded out uh, a great number of people and whittled it down to 18 with a few backups and randomly assigned them into groups. Nine inmates, nine prisoners. The inmates got jumpsuits and shaved heads and the, the, the guards got, you know, billy clubs and badges and khaki suits and aviators. Um, the amazing thing about the experiment was, like Denora said, human nature, but it was also people falling into roles. How quickly these arbitrary people who were flipping a coin, you're a, you're a prison guard, you're an inmate, how quickly that person became a legitimate inmate and that person became a legitimate prison guard. Day one was t pretty much fine. I believe the only thing that happened was uh, prison guards were forcing push-ups on the inmates for, for being disobedient, which made the guards completely unprepared for day two, uh, real disobedience. There was a prison riot, as they call it. They locked themselves in their little cells in the basement of Stanford University psychology department. They tore off their numbers you know, from, from, from their standard prison issue jumpsuits. And they sat there and smoked cigarettes and said, you know, whatever, we're going to do our thing. Infuriated the guards, they called for backup. Backup showed up without requesting overtime. Um, and they responded in kind. They pulled the fire extinguishers off the walls, got them out of there real quick, searched their cells, stripped them down, and uh, the de real dehumanizing began there. Uh, I think it was by the third day. It was before the third day. It was in the 36th hour. Um, one guy actually started losing it, broke out in a psychosomatic rash, one of the, one of the inmates, uh, because of uh, the things that, that, that were being inflicted upon him and all of these insane rules. This is the 36th hour. 
as a result of, of the, this prison riot where suddenly they all had to be in bed by 10 p.m. None of these things were prescribed by Zimbardo himself. This is just the guards doing their thing. The same types of people, it was just a coin toss. These are all college educated middle class kids in Palo Alto doing this for 15 bucks a day. Put them in bed by 10 p.m. Defecate in buckets without the option of dumping the bucket out. Um, when they did have pri uh, uh, toilet privileges, they were told to clean it out with their bare hands. 36 hours into it. And I think we have a sound clip. I was told that I couldn't quit. And at that point, I felt that, well, it was really a prison. And at that point, uh, I don't know, I just, there's no way I can describe how I felt. I just felt totally hopeless. More hopeless than I'd ever felt before. 36 hours. This guy was pre-screened. All of these guys were pre-screened. These guards were pre-screened. They were coin toss guards. They were the same people, more or less. And this was happening. And, and sort of what, what it awakened in, in people, as far as I can tell, is they suddenly realized what happened when you put otherwise good people into a very evil place. That's the question. What happens when you put good people into an evil place? And I think that's sort of what sparked my interest in what I do now. What do you think about stats now, Elena? Yes or no? Yep. Yeah? It's a mess. A lot of people don't know it. The sort of thing you see on television is like a cell door slamming or lock up raw. Um, you don't always see um, all of these things that are happening right before your very eyes. Kind of ties into the Zimbardo thing, whereas he had 50 people coming in and out and seeing all of the atrocities that were happening. Um, Zimbardo being the guy that was running the, the Stanford prison experiment. And only one person out of those 50 said, this is crazy, man. You've got to shut this down. He ended up falling in love with that person and marrying her. Cal fell in love with her, too, and hired her. I don't remember her name. She still works here. Yeah. Now we're talking. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Allen. Um, and so it's not always our fault when we miss the really obvious things that are going on around us. No one's here to blame. And I want to make it very clear that I'm not here to persuade anyone to become a prison activist or a Berkeley hippie or whatever I might be. But you should know some of the facts. Schwarzenegger issued an emergency proclamation for 29 of the 33 state prisons in 2006. Schwarzenegger was actually a pretty OK guy as far as prisons went back then, he actually got it a little bit. He saw there was a problem earlier than some other people did. He ended up, like in most matters, selling out in the end and doing nothing. Um, basically, every aspect of the court is, of the adult prison and parole system is under court supervision. Uh, the courts have deemed prison hospitals unconstitutional and have placed the entire prison medical system into federal receivership. I didn't know too much about this before I started working at San Quentin. This is like the biggest embarrassment you could possibly have as a state. It's like having your parents come in and tell you, shame on you, and, you know, I don't know, you can't drive the car this weekend, I'm going to use it to do something else. I, I, it's like having a babysitter. We can't handle our own medical system. Um, and then we've got this. We were asked to release up to 57,000 people to reduce overcrowding because we're currently at 182% capacity. And what that means is, do I have a laser pointer so I don't stand in front of this thing in, the, in my MERS? <clears throat> Basically what it means is 182%. Uh, I think that means 22 eggs into a... 12 egg carton, something like that. They've taken, and it's right, I think it's in there. Uh, maybe not. Did 
there it is. Right there. If I'm going down, you're all going down with me. Is that guy leaving? Right there. Right there. I got my eye on you. Is that a churro? Can you even get a burrito? Okay, so um, where are we? We're at 182% capacity. What this means is when we do our day-to-day, -day, when we walk by in the prison, we see people everywhere. And we don't see many happy people. They used to have gyms inside of the prison. You can be happy more or less anywhere sometimes, as long as it's not cruel and unusual, I think. I've seen Cool Hand Luke. Some of those guys are having a good time. Um, no one's having a good time in California prisons. We've converted all of our gyms into what we call dorms. It's not like Unit 3. Their dorms are huge gymnasiums with men stacked in bunks, surrounded by other men stacked in bunks. 200 men. In the case of San Quentin, unclassified, it's a reception center. That means no one knows what their gang affiliation is, what their real, how violent their history inside the prison truly is. Um, and they're just all hanging out with each other, and it gets pretty nasty in there. And the only way that I can really ever convince anyone of how bad it is would be if somehow we could all one day take a tour and smell it. It's like nothing I've ever smelled in my life. And it doesn't help when the occasional CO correctional officer shuts down the showers to punish someone in a back channel way. There was a small fight, someone was gambling, there was tobacco found. They'll sh shut them off for five days. Young men, 220 I think, uh, inside of the reception dorm. Five days, no shower. Here's a big problem. Two-thirds recidivism. Parole failures are the single largest con contributor to new prison admissions. And eventually, that's what we're going to talk about when we get into the computers. We, we're, we're, we're pretty sure, and most experts are pretty sure, we just listen to the experts. Hello, Professor Malden. We listen to those who know, and those who know basically say there's where the problem is. We're the only state that actually mandates 100% parole for everyone that leaves. That means everyone that goes is being watched. So it's a system that feeds itself. I forget if we have more stats or do I, is it a video or something? How do we get in this mess? Pause it for one sec. That's what this video does. This will pick up, I hope. We'll see, because right now it's uncomfortable. It's boring. It's not that boring, but it's sad is what it is. It really is. And I don't like talking about it. This guy does a pretty good job of it. His name is Mark Fiore. He does a lot of cartoons for the SF gate. Um, I asked him if I could use it. He didn't say no. Um, and this seems pretty educational, so let's, let, let's roll it. Hooray and stab away. In the criminal justice system, there are two separate groups. Tough on crime, pro-prison, good people. And then there are the sissies who want reform. These are their stories. California knows how to do it right. Thanks to all the tough on crime ballot measures, the prison guards union, and steely politicians, they log up 175,000 prisoners, each one costing over $46,000 per year. They don't call it the Golden State for nothing. That's the same Golden State that only pays $4,600 per student in the Cal State University system. Diplomas? Too expensive. Bologna sandwiches and bars? Just right. Hooray and stab away. Through the wonders of the war on drugs and mandatory sentencing, we're the most prison-full country in the world, with millions behind bars. Guantanamo's got nothing on our good old homegrown prisons. So skip those sissy reform measures and keep the USA number one in prisoners. With baseball-based sentencing measures, you have more prisoners to lock up, which gives you less money for rehabilitation, which brings more newly released prisoners right back to prison, which makes me more happy than ever. So just say no to prison and sentencing reform, so I can say hooray and stab away. Okay, before I move forward, do we have any questions? 
have been sort of all over the place here, possibly. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Or I can just repeat what you say. Go for it. We have an answer for that. Yeah, we will get to the computers, and we'll get to we'll get to it pretty soon. But I'll, I'll let you know why we didn't get it why we didn't get to it earlier uh, when it gets there. Anything about what we've covered so far? Okay. On a level from like one to ten, how bummed out are you? Seven to fourteen. How about that? Okay. Um, we've done some good things. If we can get the map up there. So this is San Quentin. Um, if you do one, want to go one forward? Before Elaine and I took over, these are the rooms that we were in. Um, our prison population keeps growing. Sammy the Shiv was talking about that sort of thing. We have a lot of prisoners in California. We have a lot of prisoners in America. We have more prisoners in America than we have in China, more than Russia, more than a whole ton. We have 5% we have of the world's population and close to 25% of its incarcerated population. It's insane. California is the most incarcerated state in the union. This is where our program was when we started, which is Basic education. I don't know, is Miss Vicara here? No. No? Well, that's her room. And that's adult basic education two. Um, that's AB1. And this is a high school parallel course with Dr. Merez. It's basically um, some of the lowest level that non ESL classrooms and one high school parallel, which is a little bit higher up than the GED. This is where we are now. Arts and Corrections, Print Shop, where we make San Quentin News, where we help with Photoshop, where they make San Quentin News, which is a phenomenal paper. Machine Shop, where the CAD happens and where, uh, where um, the me mechanical engineering goes down. ESL. These are eight unit classes. There's me in poetry and drama. There's another adult basic education classroom. All in all, we're in about, we work with about one dozen teachers out of, I think, 38, give or take, in the vocational and educational side. We had some help to, in our expansion. We're also moving into SQTV if it stays open. We'll get into it later, but like, like Berkeley, like Cal, like the UC system, like the state system, prisons are in a little bit of trouble these days, prison education specifically. Our daily grind is we drive through here, and we are super bummed out because it's still dark, and it's early, and we're tired, and we're students. And we get to East Gate and we get hassled because we're wearing blue or orange or yellow or green or open-toed shoes or no socks or an exposed thong from time to time. But once we get through East Gate and we walk through this, it gets a little worse because we have to walk through the yard to get to education, a little bit through the yard to get to art, all the way through the yard to get to ESL and vocational. And here is where it's just like the movies. And you've got uh, the Mexican guys are hitting the punching bags there and doing push-ups. You've got the Asian guys gambling on the tables. You've got the black guys shooting hoops. And there's no intermingling. It's exactly like the movies. It's exactly like people hoped 50 years ago the world wouldn't be. And there it is, staring at you in the face. And it's terribly depressing. Once we get into these classrooms, it's a whole different story. You've got guys sharing. You've got two dictionaries for 26 guys. You've got a guy with these offensive tattoos running up their arms, handing it to whatever nationality next to him. 
everything's being shared, everyone's talking, a lot of fist bumping because high fives and handshakes are illegal in most classrooms, on, in most areas in the prison. Um, and then we go in our rooms and we just sort of do our thing. Where I'm in poetry, I don't know, am I, are you keeping up at all? I'm just going to skip over stuff and just keep rolling with it. Um, where I go, where I ro roll in poetry over there, um, just last week, I had, essentially the way it works is we get these guys for eight weeks, and this is where they go before you can program into any other section of the, of the prison. Programming just means anything that you do that's not sitting in your bunk. So if you're in vocational, if you're in education, whatever it is, you've got a job somewhere, you have to go through this system first, through Calm. We get them for eight weeks, and we try to make them a little better adjusted during that time. I'm there two days a week doing poetry and drama. Anita Sufi's there for the full four-day work week, and uh, she's doing all kinds of stuff with them. We were doing something. I, I shoplifted a class from Melanie Abrams, who's here on campus from a writing class. Basically took one of her writing assignments and gave it to the guys. I said, come up with a list of objects that describes you things of value, maybe it's things of garbage, whatever it is, something that, something that speaks, says something about you without actually saying something about you. And one guy leaned over to me, Mr. Jerry, and he said, you know, can I use freedom? And, and, and I kind of felt like the judge from The Simpsons. It was like, it's not really an object, but I want to see where he's going with this. So he went for it, put his pencil on the paper, looked at me and said real quietly, I don't know how to read. So at that point, we had to take a couple steps back. I'd say this guy was about 50 years old. I didn't know yet. This was his first day, and also my first day with him. I didn't have his test results. They take these tests called TABES, so we know where they're at, so we know at where they are. And uh, what ended up happening was... Um, we just sounded it out. Do we ever do that slide? The f. Do we ever do that? Can we do that? Let's we'll see if I think these guys can probably read. I said, well, well, what do you think? Freedom. How does it start? He didn't know. So I said, okay, let, let's do this phonetically. What do you guys think? Um, I spoiled it. <laughs> what do you think it is? Did you? You spoiled F. Excellent. And I said, fur. What do you think came next? Don't, don't be afraid. That's right. E. E. Keep going. Don't get impatient. Keep going. You'll get it, guys. Excellent. Free duh. Free duh. Correct. D. Free duh. Free duh. Don't stop. You're really close. A is what he guessed as well. Let's try one more. Free duh. U is very close. Keep going. Run through all the vowels. Do you know the vowels? <laughs> Sometimes. Let's try O just for fun. Freedom. Freedom. Then he looked at it and he said, something's not right. I'm like, you're right. What do you think is wrong? He told me right off the bat. It's missing something. What is it missing? Exactly. Pop that sucker in there. He had to do a few erasers, but he got it. The whole, the, the whole free writing thing was supposed to take five minutes. You don't take your pen off the paper. You make a list of things. People came up with my Chevy Camaro. We had five Bibles. We, one guy had his water ski. We had all kinds of PlayStation 3s. Um, I don't know if I put it. We had a motorcycle. We had, we, we had some really good things. This guy got his one word out. By the time he was done, his page was soaking wet with tears. He had just written his first word ever, and it was freedom. With Anita Sufi as my witness, she's not here now. I'm not making this up. And it's sort of a story. Some of our tutors are here right now from class, and you can never forget the kind of impact that you've had on these men. 
And for the rest of you that were growing impatient as I was telling this story, think about the educators that do it nine hours every day, full time at San Quentin, and how hard that is, and how lucky those men are to have them. And then take into consideration that they're getting cut by 75% January 1st. The only programs that are being cut, the only across the board cuts other than the 15% pay cuts that instructors here have had to take to as a result of working for a state school are happening in education and rehab. CDCR stands for California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. The R has been completely evacuated of meaning. Every single instructor we work with, except for one, has received their pink slip and is looking for a job now, in the middle of the school year, when no one hires teachers. It's, 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 it's bad news, it's sad news. There are some ways that we can help that we might talk about later. The good news about our program is if someone is there to open the gate, we are volunteers. We are recession proof. And if we want to move into the computer lab, do we ever make a slide for the flow chart? What do we want to do? You want to do flow chart? Do we ever do the San Quentin, the little San Quentin computer lab that was designed in CAD? I thought it was really nifty. This is actually made in the program that we're teaching there now. Um, I don't know how to use CAD. We have a guy named Chris Scruggs and another gentleman named Eric McDonald that, that, that sort of uh, designed the curriculum around CAD. But we have two options for where we're going to put this lab. We'll talk about that later. The reason why we didn't go into the research earlier is because if you look in the CDCR website, it says 60 days until you are either approved or denied for your IRB. IRBs are what everyone has to go through if you're going to do research on humans. Humans are delicate, sensitive beings. And prisoners are even more delicate and sensitive. I think the only way we could have gotten more delicate and sensitive would have been if we were doing a pregnant prisoner in a, some, some institution somewhere. But 60 days wasn't bad. We put together, with the help of uh, Vanessa McMahon, a researcher from UCSF, we put together about 40 pages of our IRB. It was all set and ready to go, fired off to, ready to get fired off to the UC uh, Berkeley IRB board. And we had to do two. Contrary to what their website said, CDCR uh, will not return it within 60 days. CDCR is not accepting new applications, and any old applications are getting tossed. So we effectively can't do the research that we want to do. So what do we do? We roll with the punches. You have an answer? No, I have a question. Yeah? So I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm puzzled as to why um, there's a difference here. Because you're teaching these other classes without having to get an IRB, but when you teach computer classes, do you need an IRB or a test topic of research? Well, right. The, the, the main point of teaching this class, I mean, I think what's good for our hearts is that we're teaching these men how to do things. We're giving them skills that they need. And we'll talk about what we're going to actually, the skills that we are going to give them. But um, the thing that's really helpful is saying we were able to put these computers in, we were able to see these results, and now we want this much more money. We can ap approach Department of Justice. This is the first program that's ever gone into a prison in California. And we don't do any research as far as which vocational programs are most effective. California has no idea. Legislative analyst office says we lack the tools. They lack the tools. CDCR lacks the tools to track. We said we will track for you. We will track. We will research it. We will tell you whether or not this affects employability, whether or not we ourselves are able to track employability, whether or not it, it, it affects their wages upon release. So you didn't need to do this for the drama We're not doing research on drama. Okay. We're not, this is only for research. So basically, everything that we do here, if it can't be researched and can't be published, it's happening, it exists in a vacuum. There's 33 prisons. San Quentin's lucky because it's close to us. Tobias Wolf goes in there. We all go in there. It's pretty close to the Bay Area. It's close to Berkeley, or it's in the Bay Area, close to Berkeley, close to San Francisco. But we need to do research to make this thing bigger. There's no reason why there aren't more computer labs. We need to make, take the very first steps to show people how Citrus understood 
we just need a few computers in one prison to show how useful this could be. How do you expect someone to get a job if they don't know how to use Craigslist, if they don't know how to get online? We cannot now, at this point, research whether or not that is truth. It seems like a no-brainer. We think it might be a no-brainer, but we're not allowed to say that. We have to actually file the forms. Yeah, sir. Don't let me go on like that forever. Thank you. The only distinction is research, is we can't publish the results of what we find here. We don't do research on anyone in basic education. They do their own internal research. They see how many GEDs have been produced in how many years, I'm sure. But we don't, we're not trying to do research. We don't gauge our own efficacy of tutoring someone toward reaching their high school degree or their GED. Um, the only thing we wanted to research was these computers, and for now it's on hold, except for our internal evaluation, which we're hoping will yield the same results. And we're hoping, even though it won't be publishable, that it'll still provide some sort of proof that yes, this was a good idea, yes, this was possible, and yes, we should try to expand it. Sir. And that is what we're doing. So, so I'll try, let me try to be clear about this. San Quentin currently has three computers for 5,000 inmates. And not all of them have access to those three computers, but most of them do. About 1,000 of them are in reception, and they don't get to go there. But if you're not wearing orange like those guys, you can. As you can imagine, there's a very long line. We will teach these classes regardless of research, regardless of, of what they tell us we can and cannot publish. We called it the San Quentin All Access Computer Center because we decided the first one to come up with the ugliest name wins, and that was me. And then we started calling it Squawk because it kind of spells that. Even worse. We are opening this up to as many people as we possibly can for basic computer training and for computer aided design. And so we will be teaching on these computers. The bummer is this being a research exchange meeting, we won't be able to publish any research as of right now. No, you cannot go you you cannot go online. So we have simulation, essentially simulation. Um, we have been able we've been approved to set up the the lab doesn't go in until February first, which is when our next round of teaching will begin at the prison. Um, Anyone that's currently enrolled at the adult, at the Philip E. Burton Adult School of Education, so there's about just over a thousand right now. Um, we take them directly from. Do you have the? Do we? Do we? Did we make a an enlarged thing of? Oh, you mean how? How are we recruit? How are we teaching them right now? If, if there's no computer lab, so we haven't engaged anyone. Can we get microphones? <laughs> One moment. The state you're in is just putting the computers in? That's February 1st is when the curriculum starts. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I was just wondering how you plan to engage people in a training that's simulated but not real, well, but at the same time to, to get them, to, uh, you know, are people signing up because they're interested in finding new jobs or what's, what's the hook? So, so two questions. First is the hook. If, if you are offered programming at the prison, you will take it as an inmate, period. What's the benefit to them? Uh, they don't sit on their bunks for 20 hours of the day, That's period, enough. as most of them do. As more than 50% of all California inmates do, they sit on their bunks for 20 hours a day. So if you get programming, you don't sit on your bunk. Um, janitorial staff at San Quentin is hugely popular. It's a good gig. You get 29 cents per hour, and you don't sit on your bunk. And that's, that, that's, that's one huge draw. The other huge draw for us is we are 70, somewhat vibrant, very vibrant, somewhat attractive, 
very engaged people. And what I found is while they might not be going in for all the right reasons, such as just the new energy, they, they might not have a crave for learning immediately. Even if they're trying not to learn, if you sit around in a room where everyone else around you is engaging, you're going to learn things. Which is why we found, in, since we've been there in the last three years, every subsequent semester, they've obtained more GEDs. The more tutors UC Berkeley puts in this program, the more GEDs they've obtained. So we're just transferring that and we're saying, well, let's try computers. We think we can teach them that. The second question, can you repeat it? Yeah, I was just oh, thinking internet, in right. terms of your plan, um, I mean, it, it makes sense that people would need this type of skill set to just participate in the society right. because it's continuously integrated into our daily life. Um, and yet this is a population that has been large, you know, largely excluded. Nobody likes you once you go to jail. And um, it's difficult to get a job. They're usually undereducated, underemployed, blah, blah, blah. You already know the story. Um, the question then is, once you do get them involved uh, under the constraints that the prison provides, how do you plan to engage them in the learning curve um, and under a constrained environment um, in terms of the possibilities that you can tap into, um, limited, you know, in terms of not being able to be, get online so that you can transfer and make, ensure that people who are sitting on their butts, like you said, um, are gaining some benefit from the inputs. What are the inputs, basically, that So we we'll have, do you have the slide with the, with the homeworks? It's, you have to remember baby steps. Um, at least a quarter of the people that I put in front of the computers initially, the first ones that went in, oh, this is all, this is all for SolidWorks or, or for, for the, the CAD programming. But on our other worksheets, the very first one is point out the power button and the CD-ROM drive. You'd be surprised how many people get that one wrong. So that's step one. How do you turn it on? What is a mouse? What is a keyboard? After that, you start working on more complex problems. There is uh, one provider of a simulated internet program that essentially has hyperlinks for a non-networked computer so you can, you can get on Firefox, you can get on Internet Explorer, and you can use a limited sort of, you can learn how to browse the web without actually having the freedom, heaven forbid they have access to information, right? So we try to give them the next best thing. So if your question is engagement, it's going to happen automatically. We'll have a line out the door. We'll have, we have, there's far greater demand than we have seats. Um, if your question is how do we teach them effectively, that's part of our study. How do we teach them effectively? We, try to, we, we, we measure their skills when they get in, we test them at the middle, we test them at the end, and we see if anything's stuck. Our main, yeah, yes sir. Well, I didn't want to stop you mid-sentence. Well, it's just the, the last is that our general goals for the gentleman in the basic computer training are turning it on, using the keyboard and mouse, and Microsoft Office. We want these guys to all be able to type their resume before they get out of there. And then if we have time, we're going to do the simulated internet as well. Can you say who donated the computers? Oh, that would be Citrus. That would be this very... Who, who manufactured the computers? Oh, so, yeah, that was another problem. What we're doing right now is we were getting... Citrus was actually trying to negotiate with Intel for a while to try to get us hooked up with some freebies, and I think, I know that did fall through. So what we're trying to do now is we have 11 machines total. We need 14 machines because it's, there are 27 student rooms, and we need one for the volunteer instructor from our program. So we're a few short... Um, we're trying to use the buying power of the UC. Um, we're looking out for any departments that are going through their cycle right now. And if worse comes to worse, we're just going to go through um, the department purchase through the Scholar's Workstation. If anyone has any computer hookups, we'd love to use them. Um, one, we do, we're being sort of uh, held hostage by the service guarantee. They're not going to let anything in that, that doesn't have the the golden three-year warranty. That's what their internal IT has told us. And I think the, the first time I emailed Citrus and told them that, I got a response 10 seconds later, would they like fries with that? <laughs> and it is a little absurd, but it's what we're working with. And they've shot down. They've tried to put in these some sort of computer lab 
about three times in the last 15 years. And this is the first one they've actually approved. Sir. Uh, two things. One is um, a suggestion. Can you download a Wikipedia snapshot as, you know, um, you know is, is the problem with them being on the internet really access to information or is it access to them being able to buy stuff and things? Would they let you just take, because Wikipedia provides snapshots of like as of such and such a date, here's all of Wikipedia. And that would um, not only be a good hyperlink text, but it would be full of information. And uh, a question is, um, are you thinking about teaching them computer programming? Uh, the only programming is, is the CAD. Uh, for whatever level of program that is, I'm not, I'm not the guy developing the CAD curriculum, but we don't have any, any programming courses that we're planning right now. But because this is sort of a lesson in adaptability, I mean, we were, when this thing started, we were nowhere. And then we were, um, these, by we, these computers, we're going to have to go into uh, the vocational unit where ESL is and, um, and uh, the machine shop and the sheet metal shop, which requires strip downs in and out, which a lot of guys just won't do. So we didn't want that. Then we ended up in the uh, laundry sorting facility which was awesome. It was like the basement of 21 Jump Street. I actually really liked it. It was super dusty, though. Um, and a uh, uh, horrible consequence of all the teachers that they're losing um, in January is there will now be an available room because there are no more teachers, or not, not as many as there once were. There's now an available room that will be able to move these computers in that's a traditional classroom setting that uh, has the appropriate outlets for, for our needs. But that's a phenomenal idea. I did not know that you could download whole chunks of Wikipedia at once. And we'll have to run that by them to see if they'll let it happen. Um, but that's a great idea. And we're definitely going to look into it. That's exactly what we want to do. And why buy a simulation package if you can get almost the real thing in a can, right? Yeah. So that, is the teaching in prison decal going to be expanded so that um, more like of the UC Berkeley students are going to teach the computer program labs, or is it is this going to be like is this is, is this going to detract from the like teaching in prison? Like who are, who's teaching the programs? Are the students teaching? Yes, them? students are, but we actively recruit engineering students to do the CAD programming and CS students to do the basic computer design. So everyone else will still be doing GED, poetry, whatever they, you know, whatever floats their boat. So we're not reducing any, any of our own programs. Are we done? Yeah, I just want to say it's 1 o'clock, so I know we need to break. I know people need to go to class. And I want to thank Wes and Elena um, for talking about it. People are welcome to stay for questions. <laughs> Please feel free to ask any questions that you have after the fact. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, we'll stay to answer any questions if you guys have any. And thank you.